Hi brothers and sisters, Jerry O'Donnell here with Four Angels Messages to continue with part four of walking through the Bible regarding how to keep holy the Sabbath day. Uh, I never meant it for it to be four parts, but I know personally that uh, when I came into the church, it was well proven which day was the Sabbath day. I grasped hold of that. However, no one really told me how to really keep it holy, and someone kept saying that, or many kept saying that, oh, but you'll, you'll find out on your own. Yeah, through many embarrassing uh, steps, that is. And then over the years, you know, I've been an Adventist, uh, uh, well, I guess this is, uh, this is the year of uh, my 30th anniversary, wow. But nonetheless, um, 30 years as an Adventist. And that makes it uh, half and half, half of uh, being born a Catholic and then half of it being a Seventh-day Adventist. Anyways, um, my point being though is that uh, there was a lot of embarrassment to learn it and over these 30 years, I'm still learning, especially as I read Ellen White's writings, uh, about keeping holy the Sabbath day. And so I'd like to share with you more of these understandings, and we'll keep it to the Bible because Ellen White has a plethora of items uh, going into detail that uh, would be many, many more sermons. And so I encourage you to uh, read different things. Uh, you know, there's the Adventist Home um, uh, for one recommendation, but uh, there are many other Ellen White books that uh, there's at least a chapter as far as keeping the Sabbath day holy. And again, the purpose of these me messages, this four-part series, happens to be if we can't understand how to keep holy the Sabbath day now, what makes us expect that when the contrast between Saturday and Sunday comes about in this land and then worldwide, how are we going to be able to truly make sure that we are keeping the Sabbath day holy? Well, we might shun uh, the Sunday sacredness, but uh, does that mean we really are keeping holy the Sabbath day? You see, there's a principle, and that is, if we avoid the mark of the beast, we don't necessarily get the seal of God. But if we have the seal of God, then we will be able to avoid the mark of the beast. Interesting how that happens. So I'm just trying to lay down the groundwork for people to ponder. Hmm, it's not obviously uh, something that's dictated um, because these are applications and it's up to us individually in the conscience to apply these things but I want to give you at least food for thought regarding these subject matters. Now we already covered the Old Testament and Matthew, Mark, and Luke already. So we're going to pick up in John today and move forward to the end of the Bible and try and wrap this up in a four-part series. But there's one more thing that I'd like to share with you. Have you ever heard someone tell you that when it comes to Ellen White's writings that you ought not to uh, read things past 1888 or thereabouts um, because they're influenced by others such as her son, and other influential people in her lives as if the prophet of the Lord can be easily persuaded to be saying, I saw this uh, of God and this is what uh, God presented to me, or to blame that there is going to be then, yes, yeah, she may have penned it, but when it went through her editors and stuff like that, that they changed things all, all around. Whatever the case might be, whatever date they pick, please don't believe them. First off, you're trusting human beings of the modern age who are not prophets to criticize Ellen White's writings. Be very careful. But I have noticed, because I started reading her letters and manuscripts along with the books that she wrote, 
And uh, <clears throat> as far as the books, including compilations, I am up to the book of O at this point. But when it comes to letters and her manuscripts, they are per year and starting at 1844, moving forward, I have now reached <clears throat> 1893. And I have a method that measures out what percentage of the writings I have gone through in both cases. And I have recently reached 28% of the writings. Yeah, I know. <clears throat> when it comes to math and statistics, I guess the computer background is really coming out now. But that's not so important as it is to tell you <clears throat> that that means over or about three quarters of her writings are still yet future. So if anybody tells you past 1888 or past 1890, uh, don't trust anything because of the influence, they're throwing out three quarters of what Ellen White wrote. So that's the big lie that you want to avoid. So don't do it. Do not be subject to it. Ellen White has penned enough in multiple books so that you can compare things to see what is the most accurate statement if you are questioning something, especially when it comes to compilations. Because the compilers, I like to say inadvertently, but not all the time, will make mistakes. And I'm wondering if it's sort of working in a little bit of an agenda along with it. I know that's an accusation, but there are some things that uh, we practice as a church today that when you read through all of Ellen White's writings, it's not the same thing. And so let us be careful and let's compare even her writings to make sure. For instance, I have already uh, had a situation that I brought out in a previous sermon about the 6,000, the 4,000, the 2,000 years uh, of time and um, there's one statement that was copied that just pondered me and when I see the exact same wording in 10 other places all leaving out one word that tells me that word was accidentally or intentionally accidentally or intentionally inserted into that one quote that gave me trouble and so that's what I'm saying. We need to be very careful. So on that note, let's dive into uh, the final message, at least I hope so, God willing, and uh, we'll begin with prayer. Our Father, thank you so very much for this time to spend with thee in thy word. Open our eyes, our minds to your promptings of the Holy Spirit. And as I am a willing vessel, I pray that you will use me to speak to your people now and that you will touch each of our hearts that we would want to be better Sabbath keepers than we are even now. And as we read the verses, I may expound upon them, apply them in a certain manner, which is appropriate. But may other thoughts also come to mind of other applications, especially personally, as I do not know everyone's personal life. But you do, and you can impress them of what is acceptable to thee on the Sabbath and what is not. And now we ask for your guidance. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> All right, as I said, we're going to pick up in the book of John. And we're going to start in John chapter 7. And in fact, in all honesty, there is only one reference in John. John chapter 7 is where we're going. And let's take a look here in verse 23. John 7 and verse 23. The Bible says here in John 7 verse 23, If a man on the Sabbath day receives circumcision that the law of Moses should not be broken. Are ye angry at me because I have made a man every whit whole on the Sabbath day? And so again, we see the medical coverage here that 
uh, if they are going through the practice, which is a medical procedure and a serious one, to keep the law of Moses and do it on the Sabbath as is directed of God, then don't we think that uh, making somebody to be less painful, meaning whole, uh, on the Sabbath so they can enjoy the rest of the Sabbath, wouldn't that be appropriate? And that's what uh, Jesus is bringing out here. Again, that does not mean that we set up, if we are a physician, that we want to relieve all aches and pains uh, uh, like regular office visits. We don't want to do that on the Sabbath day. But if there was uh, an emergency situation, we don't turn around and say the opposite where oh, it's the Sabbath, I can't do this. So let's keep things balanced in that regard. So now moving out of the book of John, we're going to have a bulk of verses out of the book of Acts and uh, then finish off in Hebrews. That's basically all that's remaining in, the, in this message. But we have about five verses to expound upon in the book of Acts. Um, let's go to Acts chapter 13. Actually, hold up a moment. Uh, go to Acts, I'm thinking it's 1, um, let's take a look here, Acts chapter 1 possibly, and not seeing it leaping off the page at me right now. Um, sorry, but I'm going to reference it anyways. In Approximately Acts 1 or 2, and I don't know how I missed this, but uh, there is a reference to taking a uh, Sabbath day uh, a journey, basically. Um, and it's, yeah, it, it's uh, bothering me a, a little bit that uh, somehow it was accidentally left out. So obviously the study that we're doing is not all inclusive, but nonetheless, uh, I want to uh, 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 share with you that there is a reference where they were a distance away and they referred to it as a Sabbath day journey. What that means is uh, not giving us permission necessarily to uh, journey uh, intensively on the Sabbath, there is a permissible amount of journeying. And uh, now we did discuss this before. We're not going to set a fine line as far as, well, yeah, if you, like one pastor did, uh, where if you travel more than an hour on the Sabbath, you're breaking the, the Sabbath. And uh, well, that's not fair for those that really live a distance away from the closest church, like an hour and a half. And I know of, a, of, a, of people. And are you telling me then that the pastor that uh, after he delivers the, the sermon at the church that uh, as he goes and visits, especially in the summer where it stays light to nine o'clock at, at night or maybe even later if you're closer to, like I said, I had an experience in Michigan that it's, it's Sabbath it wasn't taken out to 10 o'clock. Are you telling me if the pastor was actively visiting from home to home, traveling hours upon hours in the car? Because in some places, to get from one person's house to another, it's not like it's city driving that uh, just go a few blocks and then uh, park your vehicle and another few blocks and another vehicle. Sometimes it's you know 45 minutes to an hour between homes because we're so scattered as a people. And so those that don't attend church, 
uh, a kind thing is for the pastors to, to go visit on the Sabbath, especially if it's a communion Sabbath. And with that in mind, are you saying that that's not permissible? And are you saying that if someone had a speaking engagement, that they were to travel as opposed to, well, if you get a hotel uh, nearby, and uh, you know, I know some Sabbath environments have uh, accommodations, you know, stay at this person's house and stuff like that. Sometimes that's not always uh, the best option. But uh, in comparison to, you know, having a hotel stay as, as opposed to a, a little bit of travel on the Sabbath, I personally would rather get up earlier s Saturday morning to make a, a, a church visit as opposed to staying somewhere and the travels on uh, Friday and um, all, all of those things. So we need to be very careful, but there is a difference. Uh, for instance, when I used to travel down to Florida and then after sticking around and enjoying the afternoon and everybody's going home now, well, I might as well go home too. But in the summer, uh, that may require several hours of travel. And so uh, some people are a little uncomfortable when I say, yeah, I was in the car for four or five hours on the, on the Sabbath. Uh, on the highway and and it's like uh, why are you uncomfortable uh, I'm not listening to secular content uh, where there's rest stops I might pull over and just close my eyes for a little bit a little bit of meditation a little bit of reading along the way I just leisurely take my time coming home back to, to home and uh, you know like I said we need to be very careful about that and I'm pretty sure that that reference that I'm looking for happens to be in uh, Acts 1 or 2 and uh, if I'm mistaken on on that my apologies but let's move on now let's get moving here with Acts chapter 13 in Acts chapter 13, we're going to look here in verses 14 to 16. The Bible says in Acts 13, 14 to 16, but when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch in, in Pisidia and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down and after reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue said unto them, saying, Ye men and brethren, if ye have any word of exhortation of the people, say on. Then Paul stood up and beckoned with his hand, uh, said, Men of Israel, and ye, uh, ye that uh, fear God, give audience. And so gathering again, uh, on the Sabbath day, in the scriptures, it's definitely highly encouraged. Uh, they met in the synagogue. We meet in churches today. Uh, it, it, when there's a special guest that comes, you may want to encourage them to get up and uh, give a little bit of a message, even if they're not scheduled. Hey, look at this. We have a surprise visitor today. Uh, you know, we know he's pastor or evangelist, so and so. Uh, let them have a, a moment or two, maybe not a real long message, but something to be said. And uh, you know, why should we be put out and say, "Oh no, lunch is going to be delayed"? You know, let us be very, very careful uh, with our attitude regarding the Sabbath. Let's jump down to verses forty-two to 44 the Bible says and when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them and then uh, the next Sabbath now when the congregation was broken up many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas 
who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. And the, and the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. And so again, we have uh, the word of God being spoken, and, and that's where we should be spending a, a bulk of our, our awake time is in the word of God or getting messages from God. And when I say uh, uh, the bulk of it, it's that unlike um, uh, my former faith, it was more of an obligation, a church obligation. You show up to, to church and what you would do is pick the shortest church service, called the Mass, of course, being former Catholic, and, um, uh, and so you put in your obligation. Our attitude for the Sabbath should be that, hey, if there's a Vesper service, that's Friday night, if there's a um, Sabbath school and a church service, we should be excited to get as, uh, and participate in as much activity in the Word of God as possible. And when we have the, that alone time, nothing wrong with opening up writings of Ellen White or continuing uh, in the Word of God on our own. We don't have to be like uh, uh, your average Christian who says, well, I, I go to church once a week. That's enough Word of God for me. We need to uh, be very careful about that as well. But I do want to point out one other thing, and that is if you feel uncomfortable about keeping the Sabbath day holy, as if you feel like you're working your way to heaven, please stress your, uh, upon yourself that the fact is in verse 43 there about the grace of God. We are under the grace of God every time we keep the Sabbath day holy. Uh, it is the grace of God that draws us to want to gather together to keep the Sabbath day holy. So let's go now to Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. And let's take a look here in verse 13. The Bible says in Acts 16, 13, And on the Sabbath day we went out of the city by a riverside where prayer was wont to be made. And we sat down and spake unto the women which resorted thither. And so definitely getting out in nature is one uh, objective of uh, the Sabbath or a proper exercise thereof. Some places don't uh, give you much opportunity to do that depending on location. But nonetheless, um, if you get out in nature, don't feel guilty that you're out in nature. Also, if the environment that you're in is not conducive of proper Sabbath keeping, proper meditation, secluding yourself is highly recommended. Here, Paul was surprised actually to find the women here because whatever town they were visiting, whatever city it was, it wasn't conducive. And that's why they were actually here. That was the primary purpose, was to gather away from the city from all the distraction and commotion and things like that and go out into a peaceful location to enjoy the Sabbath, to be able to commune with God, that is. Let's go to Acts chapter 17, and let's take a look here at verses 1 and 2. The Bible says in Acts 17, 1 and 2, Now when they had passed through Amphi Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where uh, was a synagogue of the Jews. Sorry about the tongue-tying there. And Paul, as his manner was, went into them, unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the scriptures. You know, most people are used to the thinking that the sermon is the most important message of the day, and it's not. It's reasoning out of the scriptures that is more important. And so if we have Sabbath school, and we're lacking a minister for preaching, a second Sabbath school is highly recommended. No one has to uh, feel obligated of, oh, I don't know how to deliver a sermon, but you know, I'll throw something together. 
and just throwing something together is not as important as let's just study the scriptures together. And so that is, uh, again, another highly recommended activity on the Sabbath. Let's go to Acts chapter 18 now. And Acts chapter 18, which is our well, last chapter, our last uh, reference in the book of Acts already. Acts 18, let's take a look here at verses 4 and 5. The Bible says, And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath, and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks, and when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. And so, what we see here again is not only the preaching of the word, but may our focus throughout the Sabbath to draw closer to Jesus. Uplifting Jesus on the Sabbath. We have a tendency of going through sometimes formality of things and leave Jesus out of the picture. But as we see here that um, Paul was pressed in the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ getting to know deeper and deeper about the salvation is an uh, uh, well an endless study but one that should be endeavored uh, uh, onto so that we get to understand our true relationship with Jesus Christ what does it mean to be saved uh, a lot of uh, uh, you know a lot of Adventists struggle at that. You know, are you saved? And where our knee-jerk reaction is to think, oh yeah, Ellen White wrote that we should never claim to be saved. And, uh, and we come back with, I'm working on it. Well, that's a really bad answer because no, you are saved through Jesus Christ. What you're working on happens to be uh, the sanctification that is being brought through the experiences of life and though it is a lifetime achievement the process as far as you going through doesn't save anyone it's to prepare you to fit in with heaven that doesn't mean you're going in unfit but none of our works even the Sabbath keeping earns anything. Salvation is completely paid by Jesus Christ, but this is where the evangelicals and uh, the just believe crowd go too far the other way where they allow all their people to, well, sin, and let's not even mention about sin because you're not saved by giving up your sins. You are right. We are not saved by that. However, if we do not give up our sins, then the grace of God doesn't cover willful sinning and therefore we shall be lost I know it's a very challenging situation there but um, that's just one of the many topics about Jesus Christ that we should really learn to uh, have a good grasp on uh, as I said back on this save thing uh, you know you, you there are three tests that I've come up with that identifies if you are truly being fitted for the kingdom of God. And that is, are there any past sins that you haven't confessed because you're not really sorry for them? And if the answer is no to that, then you have one out of three of the questions already well under, underway. It's a good answer. Another question is, are you currently sinning? I mean, I hope not. If you're sitting in a church setting, uh, I hope that you're not, um, well, actively murdering anybody. But even in your mind, you could actually be thinking uh, uh, the ins and outs of how to perpetrate a sin. 
and that in itself is sinful. Are you doing that or are you paying attention and are you actually dwelling upon the Word of God and you're too busy for uh, uh, to be distracted with sin? And if the answer is a positive, yeah, sin's not actively happening, I'm not thinking evil thoughts, not holding animosity, therefore then you have two out of three then. The third one is a future sin. Are you looking forward to a future activity uh, of sinning, whatever it happens to be? You know, uh, well, in a few weeks is a, a, a special gathering, and uh, you know, I know there's going to be uh, alcohol served there, and you know, what will hurt to just have a, a sip? You know, if you're planning to take that sip now that's a future sin. But if there's no plans, no, I'm, I have none. I'm not, you know, scheming and planning for, for a, a sin to take place and counting down the days for it or whatever it happens to be to execute it, looking for the opportunity to sin, then that's, you have all three of the questions answered. And so you can honestly say that, uh, yeah, there's nothing holding me back for, uh, from a proper relationship with God. Therefore, he can apply his salvation to me. But that doesn't mean I can go around saying, I'm saved, I'm saved, because things can change very quickly. Tomorrow I can hit my hand, like I always use, with a hammer and uh, throw you know, a few choice words out of my mouth, get very upset and angry and curse and everything else uh, very quickly. Well, truly then I'm not a fit person for the kingdom of heaven because it is not allowed in heaven. And so if I do hit my hand tomorrow with the hammer, uh, which is always a possibility, and I don't react in that manner, then thank God for him fitting me up for the kingdom. Because remember, it's Christ who keeps us from falling. Our old self is being removed, and it's a process of time. So that is what Ellen White means by, you cannot declare yourself eternally saved at any given time. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 4 for our last text Hebrews chapter 4 and primarily we're going to look here in verse 4 for the verse that uh, we want and that happens to be Hebrews chapter 4 verse 4 for he spake uh, for he spake in a certain place of the seventh day and on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. Now again, let us be very careful of being balanced when it comes to the Sabbath. Yes, we want to be able to rest, but that does not encourage us to sleep away the Sabbath. To waste the Sabbath, is staying in bed longer, um, is so-called sleeping in, uh, and then sleep the entire afternoon away. And I know there's some exceptions if, you, you know, for health reasons, um, uh, you're under the weather and things like that, and you need some extra sleep. That's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is that the Sabbath has come and it wrecks your entire uh, bodily clock by gathering as many hours of sleep as possible that's not healthy. Uh, it, it throws every, everything off when uh, you can't wait to get home at one o'clock. And man, on on uh, Saturday or uh, summer Sabbaths, uh, if the Sabbath doesn't go out to nine o'clock, well, that's an extra eight hours of, of sleep. So I had a good night's sleep. I even went to bed early. And then I woke up late, and then I ran off to church and got my church service in and came home, and now I am sleeping the rest right up. Well, do you think you're going to be ready for bed at the appropriate time? Of course not. Um, 
therefore, we need to be very careful what we do during the Sabbath hours. It's not, uh, the Sabbath is not meant to uh, be a complete physical, non-active day. Uh, but rather, it is a day that we rest from our physical labors that can be done any other day of the week. Yes, on the Sabbath day, we continue to pick up our, our clothes that we may drop to the floor. We make our beds and put away the breakfast dishes and, and contents and thereof. Uh, we clean up after our, our, ourselves. We do the minimal things. Parents still have to correct their children on the Sabbath. Um, so there, and obviously throughout what we studied, animals need to be addressed if there's any animals to be involved. And it is not meant for a selfish day. The Sabbath was never created for selfishness. Now, we as a family do find it a little challenging because of all the restrictions that are still in place. Um, you know, it's very hard to sing in a nursing home uh, 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 to the elderly while you're wearing a mask. Uh, so that's out now. Um, and there's many other restrictions in, in place that we're not going to participate in because it's not healthy for us. But uh you know conducting bible studies on the sabbath with an unbeliever is absolutely fine take the word of god to the public distributing literature who that involves a little bit of journeying um and things like that and so let us let us uh truly keep that whole rest idea balanced because as i mentioned god did rest from his labors but he had a lot of responsibilities, and that is, he continued to give the, the breath to every creature that he created. Uh, he made sure that the world stayed, uh, worlds, that is, uh, stayed in place where they're supposed to be and follow the orbit it's supposed to orbit with. Um, you know, so therefore he did work, but he rested from his creative activities. And so we need to be careful of what we get involved in on the Sabbath uh, regarding that, and as far as creative works and things like that. And so I hope this study, first off, wasn't an insult to anybody that you knew all these things, but gave you a deeper understanding of what God really expects out of just the Bible alone. And I encourage again for the readings of Ellen White, who is uh, very specific on many other subjects about the Sabbath. And, uh, you know, I mean, we should have our clothing still uh, pulled out at night or the uh, day before on the preparation day and not wait to the Sabbath and uh, you know if there is a flaw a mismatch unclean uh, um, something uncleanly that we expect oh I'm going to wear this particular shirt with this suit and find out oh Something rubbed up against it. I didn't know that. Go through through those things so that you're not scrambling around uh, the next day on the Sabbath, uh, preparing your your outfit. Uh, nothing like uh, uh, ten minutes. We're leaving for for the church service and then uh, discover that. So all of those suggested preparations. Uh, personally, I don't think uh, that. Um, yeah, I don't think that uh, um, shaving is anything different than what it was in the old days. So therefore, uh, let us uh, take care of, on the preparation day, shaving. I mean, you still lather up and you take the razor. You know, a lot of people argue that that whole, you should take your, your baths and, and showers uh, prior to the Sabbath because back in those days they had to pull out the tub. Well, that same excuse cannot be used for shaving. 
uh, you rinse off after every stroke or so and you rinse it off and, and, and you keep shaving. And so, like I said, there are many things, but there are also spiritual things as well, like gathering the family around Friday night. Don't just, you know, when the Sabbath comes in, oh, it's the Sabbath, okay, and I guess I gotta stop what I'm doing. And the rest of the family is throughout the house and they're just hopefully recognizing that the Sabbath is in. Some people will go as far as yelling uh, around the house, hey, the Sabbath's here. Oh, okay, Dad, thank you. Uh, what nonsense. We should be all gathered together to welcome in the, the Sabbath as well. And hey, by the way, I did find that verse, you know, under the pressure of, uh, of a message, it's very interesting that... Um, um, you can't find the verse, and there it is right in front of my eyes. Back in Acts chapter 1, verse 12, it says, Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. And I'm not sure how that slipped out of the list, uh, because it clearly does say the word Sabbath. Um, it might have slipped out because I eliminated my electronic search on Sabbath days because uh, I didn't want the false references. But nonetheless, uh, uh, there we go. I, I, I read in verse 12 there. So there's a difference, by the way, in a, uh, a distance from one place to another. And it's a leisurely journey there. And you can't tell me that uh, that journey that they have here uh, is the restricted 200 steps. You know, I, I get a lot of arguments from non-Sabbath keepers that say, this is why I don't keep the Sabbath. Do you know you're not allowed to take more than 200 steps? I don't see that in the Bible. That's not in the Bible. That's one of those Pharisee rules. And if you're caught in Phariseeism, studied Jesus who tried to bring back the uh, uh, respect for the Sabbath day and not making a, a drudgery. He often on the Sabbath day, and we went through a few of those, on the Sabbath day would argue with Pharisees and Sadducees uh, and lawyers and scribes and stuff like that that all their man-made rules was bringing a drudgery down on the Sabbath day instead of being able to enjoy it. The Sabbath was made for us to enjoy, not to, to be a drudgery. Now, are there certain things that uh, could be looked upon as, well, a drudgery? Of course, especially in this modern age. I can't go to... Um, yard sales, and they're only on Saturdays. Saving a little money or finding that special little thing at a yard sale, that's worth desecrating the Sabbath over, having a bad attitude? Because be, just because you cannot participate, if that's on your mind, uh, it's, it's uh, yard sale season. If that comes up, it, often in your mind, you might as well go to the yard sale because how a person thinks that's how they really are. So again, in Acts 1.12, uh, the distance from Olivet to the, back into Jerusalem was at least a Sabbath day journey. And, uh, you know, by foot, obviously the, it's in a, a bit of a walk to there. But they took it leisurely. They can complete it leisurely before the sun went down is what they're bringing out there. And so therefore, if you do have to journey, and, and we should avoid all non, uh, unnecessary journeying. I, I totally agree with that. But uh, again, uh, there are situations in which people live such a distance away. And, uh, and one thing is uh, I know of guest speakers that would attend, uh, come to a particular area and people wanted to listen to that speaker, but didn't want to burden anybody nor take up a hotel room. So they got up extra early and drove several hours past their normal church to go hear this speaker because they appreciate their, their messages and just wanted to fellowship on the Sabbath day. So if someone traveled four hours Sabbath morning to go be with that speaker, 
and then four hours back. Is that Sabbath breaking? If you say yes, uh, I would have to say, be careful, Pharisee. Uh, we need to be very, very careful. It's the motivation of why we are doing what we're doing. Well, at nine o'clock tonight, they're going to set off fireworks for whatever holiday it happens to be. And I want to see that display. And it's after the Sabbath. But to get there, I need to travel four hours um, on the Sabbath to get to that point. Now we're breaking the Sabbath. We do not use Sabbath hours to achieve the travel, the journeying to make a secular activity. That is where our focus should be. It's not the amount of journeying. Because I can tell you this much. There are some people that journey just a matter of 10 minutes that involves a whole bunch of things. Especially when up in age, but they still can move around. To get from their place in town, and I know of a person, and I'm not going to name names, of a person that... Uh, it's very difficult upon them to get to the bus stop because they don't own a car. So now they're paying a fare, but they had to wait out in unclimate weather, you know, in climate weather where it rains, uh, snows, and windy and stuff like that. Some Sabbaths, not every Sabbath. And so then they get on, on, the, on the bus to... Uh, and it's difficult for them to be on there with uh, possibly a walker and tr drive and, and for the bus to take them to drop them off at another bus stop, which is not right there at the church. So then they end up having to walk while somebody else um, who lives one hour away, it's a breeze for them to just drive right down the highway, take that exit, there's the church. Okay. So it's not the amount of time. That 10 minutes that that poor elderly person that went through uh, uh, obviously put more effort into somebody just piling in the car. Let's just get easy on the highway and zoom right, right down there and there we are. So again, motive is a whole lot of, to, to be concerned about. Uh, and that woman that, uh, like I said, the elderly woman that took the bus fare, uh, you know, if they had to, if that's the only time that they take the bus, for instance, to get a monthly pass and pay it on a non-Sabbath day? No. If, if it's a lot cheaper to just do it on Sabbath, then that's when it's to, to be done. Uh, God doesn't want us... Uh, um, well, wasting his funds, I'll, I'll tell you that much. So we need to be wise in what we criticize people about. If it's possible to get that fare paid ahead of time, by all means, do so. But uh, if it means that you have to pay extra money, uh, that that uh, and a lot of extra money, um, no, uh, not required thereof. And so... Consider all these things. Again, these you might disagree on certain things, and that's fine. I want you to just be thinking about keeping holy the Sabbath and make sure that it is being kept holy. Each one of us need to search within because individually we will have to stand. And if we say, well, my pastor said, my pastor said, we're on shaky ground. God help us. Let's pray. Our Father, thank you so very much for this time to have spent with thee in thy word. Thank you for what you reveal to us. As these are applications, may we also come up with what personally affects us, because these were just general concepts of keeping holy the Sabbath day based on these verses. Again, May your people and myself continue to search the scriptures, read Ellen White's writings that are more direct on the subject matter, and may we become the people that you need us to become. 
We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.